Hi, my name is Julian, and I'm a dev advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. In this session, we're going to discuss feature engineering workflows. As you certainly know, feature engineering is a critical step in machine learning projects. We usually start from raw data, and we apply use case specific transforms to that data in order to build more expressive features. And these more expressive features will help the machine learning algorithm pick up the patterns in the data. And hopefully this will yield a higher quality model. Now, given the very iterative nature of machine learning, even a small project can require tens or hundreds of attempts. And it's quite likely you're going to be running your feature engineering code again and again and again and again, uh, just because you're trying out different algos, different hyperparameter combinations, and so on. And if you work with large data sets, or if you work with lots of data sets, this can be a significant waste of time and resources. So it's definitely something we want to address, uh, the ability to reuse features that we've already built. Another problem is uh, the difficulty for different machine learning teams to share and discover features that they've built. Um, and the last thing that you want is different teams uh, rewriting the same feature engineering code because they simply didn't know that the team next door had uh, already done that. And uh, another problem is uh, if you want to use your engineered features at prediction time, then um, you often need to rewrite code uh, embedded in your prediction app so that you can apply the same transforms to the incoming data that you applied on your training set. And there's always the chance that you know you get it slightly wrong and this can have a huge impact on the prediction quality. And even if you get it exactly right, you know, why would you write that code twice, possibly in different languages? So these are the three problems we want to address today. Um, avoiding running the code again and again uh, and reusing features instead. Uh, making it easier for teams to uh, share uh, features that they've built and trying to use the exact same features at training time and at prediction time without having to rewrite any code. Um, in order to uh, illustrate this discussion, I'm going to run a demo uh, and we're going to build a sentiment analysis model on the Amazon reviews dataset using a built-in algo in SageMaker called Blazing Text. Okay, so let's get started. This is a notebook we're going to run. It's available on uh, GitLab. Uh, don't worry, I'll share the URL at the end so that you can run it yourself. Uh, before we start, maybe a few words about the Amazon Reviews dataset. Uh, it's a pretty large dataset, as you would expect. Uh, it's uh, hosted in uh, Amazon S3 or storage service, and you can go and grab reviews, uh, which are actual customer reviews. Uh, for different categories. So here I will be using camera reviews. Uh, there's about 1.8 million of those. That should be enough for our purpose. Uh, but you could go and work with, uh, you know, video game reviews or, or uh, you know, television reviews, whatever, whatever you'd like to use. Okay. So this is what we're going to use uh, as far as the data set is concerned. As far as the algo is concerned, as I've mentioned, we're going to use Blazing Texts, which is a, a, an algo invented by Amazon and implemented in SageMaker. And here we will use it in a supervised learning mode in order to build a text classification model. Um, obviously, we need to understand what format that algo expects. And we can see it here. It expects uh, one uh, instance per line uh, in a text file. And the first column in that uh, line should be the label. OK, so we'll have three labels, uh, positive, negative, neutral and then obviously the text you want to classify. So uh, we'll take a look at the Amazon Reviews dataset. Um, at the moment, it looks nothing like that. And uh, we'll uh, run through simple feature engineering steps to transform the raw data into something that's similar to what you see here. OK, so that's the purpose. Let's go to the notebook now, and we can start working on this. So the high level steps are, of course, take a look at the data, uh, we'll use pandas, and uh, process it in order to uh, convert it to a format 
that uh, Blazing Text can understand, as we just saw. So there are lots of libraries for this. I'm going to use NLTK, which is a popular open source library. You could use uh, Spacey. You could use um, your own code. You know, um, I'm using NLTK here. Uh, I will go through each uh, feature engineering step because I think it's fun and I think it's, uh, it's a good way to learn about that stuff. Um, the alternative would be to use uh, SageMaker Data Wrangler, which is another capability in SageMaker where you can um, visually uh, build a transform pipeline using uh, built-in transforms and, and your own custom transforms. Um, and uh, as we'll see later on, you can actually export that uh, directly to a Jupyter Notebook that stores your engineered features uh, to a SageMaker Feature Store. Um, but we're going to go through each step here. Uh, another option would be, of course, to uh, if you have a, a predefined feature engineering script, uh, it would be to run this script uh, as, as a batch job on, let's say, SageMaker processing. Uh, why not? And, uh, and just fire it up on, on managed infrastructure. So these are just all you know options, but here, uh, I, I'm just, uh, you know, pretending to be experimenting with code and uh, and I can worry about automation later on with SageMaker processing and and other capabilities. OK, so uh, once we've uh, once we've uh, looked at and processed the data, we're going to use SageMaker feature store. We're going to create what we call a feature group, which is a, an abstraction that will hold the engineered version of our features. And we'll store them offline, uh, meaning in Amazon S3, uh, where we can query them and build data sets. And we'll also store them online, um, where we can just retrieve them at prediction time and inject the engineered features into, into our prediction request without having to rewrite any of the code because we are just using the exact same version of those engineered features uh, as we used in the training set. So that's very convenient. Uh, so once we've built the feature store and the feature group, we will build a training set and I'll show you how to use Amazon Athena, uh, which is one of our uh, analytics services. It's a super convenient way to query data hosted in S3 and with a, a simple SQL statement, we will build our data set. And if we wanted to build different versions of the data set, we would just have to alter that. <laughs> SQL code. So it's it's very it's very nice and, and simple. Uh, then we'll train the model. We'll use uh, a data set that we built. We'll use Blazing Text. And of course, we'll use SageMaker to provide us with managed infrastructure. Once we've uh, trained the model, we're going to deploy it on managed infrastructure once again. And we're going to retrieve features in the online store. And we're going to predict with them. OK, and then we'll clean up. And uh, at the very end, I'll come back to uh, how you can uh, combine Data Wrangler and SageMaker Feature Store. Okay, so we got a lot to cover. Uh, let's get started now. Okay, so the first step, of course, is to um, grab the data set. So here you can simply copy it from S3. Um, as mentioned, uh, I'm just using the camera reviews here. Okay, and then uh, import pandas, numpy, a few libraries I'm gonna need. Uh, here I'm using pandas to load on uh, those uh, those reviews okay it's uh, uh it's a compressed uh tsv file so pandas can deal with that i'm ignoring any error lines uh, like i said there's over 1.8 million reviews so we can afford to uh, lose a few here it doesn't really matter okay so we'll drop anything that causes an error or anything that has undefined values okay and we can see Okay, a little more than 1.8 million and 15 columns, which is what you would expect, what you would see on the Amazon.com website if you're looking at uh, at product reviews, uh, you know, customer ID, review ID, product ID, etc. And if we display a few lines, we actually see this. Okay, uh, so we see the IDs. The review ID is, uh, is very interesting because it's a unique identifier and we're going to need this later on. So. Uh, keep that in mind for now. Um, and of course, the product title and uh, the review headline, the review body, and the star rating right? from one to five. Uh, how happy are you with the product? Okay. And we're going to need that too for our sentiment analysis um, classifier. 
So I could work with the 1.8 million uh, reviews, but it, you know, it just makes everything a little bit longer and, uh, and I don't think it's really needed to have that much data. So I'm just going to stick to 100,000 reviews, but um, feel free to train on, on you know, smaller, bigger data set, go and, and experiment. Um, as we're loading all that stuff in, in memory, if you want to go really big here, you, you probably need a bigger SageMaker Studio instance than the one I'm using here. So uh, you, can, uh, you, can easily, uh, you can easily change it here. And you can see I'm just using a four gig instance, but if you want more, you can get more. Okay, so the first step I'm, I'm going through here is just I'm concatenating the review headline and the review body uh, because you know I want all the text in a single place. Um, should uh, should be helpful. There's there could be good information in the title as well, uh, and I, I don't want to lose the title. Okay, uh, what am I doing next? Then I'm just keeping four columns. So the review ID, like I said, this has a unique identifier. Uh, which which would come in handy later on. So I need that product ID because um, I, I you know I could see uh, scenarios where I want to build models for certain products. Let's say I want to do a a model on you know eye hand cameras. So I would have a list of relevant product IDs and I could query only those and and use those as a, a data set. And maybe I would have another model for you know low end cameras. You know, why not? So you have to keep uh, track of the product somehow, I guess. And then the star rating and the review body, okay? Everything else is not really relevant at the moment. So just like we saw before, the star rating is an integer from one to five. And if you remember the, the format that we need for the labels, which is here, um, yeah, we don't really want that. We want a text label, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to map those integer ratings to text ratings. And here I've decided to group, uh, you know, one star and two star reviews as negative, um, three star reviews as neutral and four and five star reviews as positive. But you could absolutely have five categories if you wanted to. That's that's totally OK. Just trying to simplify things a bit here. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, adding this to a new column that I call label. And once I've done that, I drop the actual integer rating. So now my data looks like this. Review ID, product ID, review body, and the label. So we're getting close <laughs> to what we need here. Um, but there's one more important step to go uh, for data prep. Um, if we carefully read this doc here, uh, it's going to tell us that we want uh, uh, blazing text. <laughs> Actually, wants um, samples that are uh, tokenized. You can see in those examples that um, everything is neatly spaced separated, including punctuation, etc. And you know clearly that's not how we write text. So see, we don't have those spaces. So we need to run a tokenizer on those reviews. So we could write one, but why? Right, it's already been done. And uh, this is where NLTK comes uh, into play. Again, you could use Spacey, you could use uh, your favorite library. And uh, we're going to use NLTK and apply a built-in tokenizer to the review body column. Uh, and this is actually a bit of an intensive step. Uh, here, I've got 100,000 reviews and it takes about 37 seconds. So if we were working with 1.8, uh, you know, we'd be looking at, uh, you know, 10, 12 minutes, maybe more. And so, this goes to show you don't want to do this again and again and again, right? You, you don't want to run through this step every time you train, just waiting for, uh, you know, 10, 12, or even more uh, minutes because you have to do that stuff again, right? So do it once and then reuse, okay? To the tokenizer actually returns an array of strings, and that's not what I want. I want a single string with everything space separated. So I have a final step where I join everything. I join the different bits of the array as a space separated string. OK, so now if I look at my data, I'm getting really close to what blazing text wants. I still have my review ID, my product ID. I've got my space separated review here and I've got my label. OK, 
So we're pretty good. Um, all we have to do for blazing text now is to basically, you know, grab those two columns, put the label first, which is what blazing text wants. And that's about it. So I think now it's time to, uh, you know, stop engineering futures because we, they have the right, uh, the, the right level of abstraction, the right, the right format. And we need to move on to storing those features. Okay. And so this is where we start using SageMaker feature store. Um, so here at first, you know, I grab uh, I, the usual stuff, the SageMaker session, the, uh, an S3 bucket, uh, the region name, etc. Okay. Um, pretty uh, generic stuff here. Next, I define a name for my feature group. So it's always good practice to have unique names. Um, so adding a timestamp is, is a nice trick. And, and the first thing I need to do on top of uh, giving that group a name is to define the name of the column that will act as the unique identifier. Okay, because the feature group will store uh, the engineered version of the rows in my data sets. Okay, and these are called records. Okay, so a row in your data set becomes a record in a feature group. And each record obviously has um, a key value pair representing the different columns in uh, in your uh, initial data. Okay, so that's that's the vocabulary, so to speak. And when I'm going to retrieve those um, uh, those records, of course, I need to have a unique ID. So this is where uh, I define that unique ID as the review ID, which we mentioned before. And, you know, it, it, it has to be something like, you know, primary key or unique ID, depending if you're working with uh, data coming from uh, relational tables or text files, doesn't really matter, as long as it's unique, right? So if you're working with uh, SQL data, then the a primary key would be perfect. Okay. Um, by the way, here I'm only creating one feature group because I've got one data source. Uh, I could have multiple feature groups. If I had multiple files, I would probably create um, one feature group per file. Or you know, if I had multiple SQL tables, I would do the same. And uh, as long as you can join uh, those uh, uh, those tables or those files uh, using a, a common you know a common key, that that's okay, right? Um, so. In general, I would say you can create one feature group per file, so long as you can actually you know, create a connection between those different sources. Right? Otherwise, just you can merge merge them and, and create a single feature group. Okay, so uh, we've got our ID uh, sorted out. Now, another nice feature in Feature Store is the ability to store timestamps. And uh, this uh, allows you to store different versions of your features over time. Okay, so you could say, well, here's my first uh, my first attempt at feature engineering, and uh, here's the timestamp for that, and uh, here's another uh, here's another uh, version uh, with a different timestamp, etc. So uh, it's important that you store that so that you can go and uh, you know, and you can literally go back in time, you know, exploring your uh, feature store, saying, hmm, you know, what was the initial version of that, and because uh, I used it for a certain model, and I'd like to try it again. Um, and so, bottom line, we need um, <laughs> we need a column for this. Uh, so it doesn't exist in our data frame right now. So um, the simplest way I found to do this is to use an API in Pandas called Assign. And uh, it, it, I find it a little bit confusing because this is actually not a parameter. It's the name of the column that you're adding. Uh, but it's maybe just me being confused. And, uh, and this is the value you're going to set on all the rows of that column. Okay, so again, what this does is it adds a new column called even time and it fills it with that uh, timestamp value that I uh, just uh, grabbed here. Okay, uh, I would recommend that you check that timestamps are correctly set. Um, as you can imagine, if uh, they're missing, uh, ingestion is going to fail. So uh, make sure somewhere in your script you actually check that. You know, this this column doesn't have any uh, empty values, uh, which, uh, you know, which is fine here. And, okay, now I can see my data set, okay, with the timestamp column. Okay, so now, before we ingest, we actually have to take care of feature definitions, 
uh, basically typing, right? What's the type of each column? So we have two options here. We could provide a feature definition, um, uh, uh, JSON uh, dictionary, and that's one way. Uh, if you love JSON, fine. <laughs> you can store those uh, 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 feature names and feature types in uh, in uh, JSON. You know, I think we see enough JSON uh, every day, so I'm going to use the other option, which is uh, I'm going to let Feature Store uh, infer the, the types from the pandas types. Okay, so here I am basically um, making sure that my four uh, columns are uh, typed with the, the string type, okay, and my timestamp is typed as uh, float, which is not intuitive. We'd like to use integer, but as it happens, you have to use float. Uh, another option for timestamps would be to use uh, human readable timestamps in the Unix format, you know, time and date, etc. Uh, that's uh, supported by uh, SageMaker Feature Store. And of course, in this case, we would use the string type. Okay. But remember, if you're using, um, um, you know, uh, timestamps just like me here, you have to set them to float. Otherwise, where you ingest is going to complain that this doesn't have the fractional type. Uh, and well, it's pretty clear what the problem is, but best to avoid it. Okay, and then we load uh, the feature definition. Okay, and uh, we see confirmation here that um, the strings and the, the fractional um, columns have been correctly picked up. And now we're uh, good to go and ingest. So we create the actual feature store, passing uh, the location, uh, the S3 location for the offline store, uh, passing the name of the column for the unique ID, the name of the column for the timestamp, a role, allowing uh, SageMaker feature store to access S3 and do everything it has to do, and also enabling the online store. Okay, so by default, it will not be enabled. So you will only get your features in S3. So if you want to use them at prediction time, make sure to set this uh, parameter to true. Okay. Um, of course, we can query the group uh, status and after a few seconds, it's created. Okay. Um, so now I guess it's a good time to show you how this looks like in, uh, in Studio. Uh, so if you go uh, to compare from components and registries, uh, there's an entry for feature store. And if you click on this, you see the feature store. Amazing. So uh, I can see my feature group here. Uh, it's listed as active, meaning it's, you know, it's ready to go. You can ingest and, and retrieve data. If I click on this, I get the summary information, right, which is pretty much the data that we passed in the uh, API call, we see the feature definitions. Uh, we could set some tags and that comes in handy if you want to, uh, you know, provide extra information on, you know, what data set this was built on and who built it and what, you know, what maybe store the name of the, of the script that was used to process data with a, you know, maybe a, a git commit or something, anything that helps understand how this was built. And this is how, you know, other teams could go and, and query the tags and discover um, features that have been built uh, across the organization. And we also provide you some with some queries because as we will see, uh, this is the preferred way to use uh, offline features by querying them uh, using Athena. Okay, but we'll get to that in a second. Of course, you could also uh, you could also create feature groups using Studio, and this would be very similar to what you saw in the API, uh, passing the name and you know enabling online storage and offline, um, the S3 bucket location, uh, PMS key you want to use. Uh, do you want to auto create? A table in the glue data catalog, which uh, I'm guessing you want to do because that's how you can easily use Athena afterwards. But you know, it's up to you. And then if you click on continue, you would provide future definitions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, nothing, nothing that would surprise you. Um, and uh, it's really uh, the same thing 
that we've done here with the API. Okay. All right. So uh, we've created the feature group and now we can very easily ingest. Maybe let me close this. Okay, so we can just ingest uh, in bulk mode, passing the pandas data frame. Uh, we can set a, a number of workers to uh, parallelize ingestion. And so this will just load our uh, pandas data frame straight to the offline store and propagate it to the online store if you enabled it. Okay, depending on your data, depending on uh, how many workers you have, this could take a few minutes, um, but very quickly you can see, and uh, let me go to, uh, let me go to Athena here. Um, if you go to the Athena console while you're ingesting, you'll see the table has been created. Uh, and, uh, and of course you'll be able to run some queries on it. So, uh, I'm actually doing this a lot when uh, ingestion runs. So here it's uh, it's over. So we should see 100,000 samples, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> and of course, we can start thinking about how we would query that data to build our data set. And actually, this is what we want to do. Uh, we want to have the label column in the first position, followed by the tokenized review. Okay. And if you look at this, compare it to what Blazing Text expects, I think we're pretty close, right? So now we could, once we have our uh, our SQL query uh, ready, uh, and again, it's the most simple one here, but you could filter on products or you know other columns, whatever you need uh, to get your data set built. Once we've done this, we can very simply create a nothing now query right which is the same query i just showed you and we can run it on the offline store and we can retrieve the results as a pandas data frame which we display and sure enough this looks exactly like what we need okay so now our pandas data frame has the right format for blazing text and we can move on to training the model so you see how easy it is to query this, build your different data sets um, without having to run the feature engineering code again and again, right? And you could still have multiple versions and manage them with different timestamps. That's that's fine. So then I would say, you know, I'll go pretty fast because this is really SageMaker business as usual. We're going to split the data set for training and validation in uh, 90%, 10%. Uh, we'll save those two files to text files which look exactly like what blazing text expects and then we move on to uh, uploading those two files to amazon s3 which is where sagemaker wants the data we grab the name of the container that implements blazing text in the region we're running in right nothing really new here we configure a training estimator passing the name of the container and our infrastructure requirements and where to store the model. Okay, again, vanilla SageMaker here. We set blazing text mode to supervised, which means build me a text classifier. We have other hyperparameters that we could tweak or um, automatically optimize with model tuning, but you know, we're not going to go into this. And uh, now we put everything together saying, okay, here's the training channel. This is where the data is. This is the format that it has. Uh, and we do the same for the validation channel. And then we fire up the training job. Okay. And it creates our managed instance, downloads the data set. Again, SageMaker as usual. We get to 91% accuracy, which is I think pretty good given the fact that I haven't tweaked anything. And uh, this trained for two minutes. As you can see, the training was actually much faster than uh, feature engineering. So uh, even more reason not to repeat feature engineering again and again and again. And now we deploy this to a SageMaker endpoint. And after a few minutes, we have a prediction API that we can use. So here, in the interest of time, I'll just show you how to retrieve um, um, a row in the uh, online store and predict it directly uh, but in more elaborate use cases 
uh, you probably would retrieve just you know pieces of uh, of the data set um, in order to uh, convert so to speak um, raw features coming in the prediction request into uh, engineered equivalents or maybe if your prediction request has already been engineered by a uh, another application maybe you want to grab additional features and uh, add them to the prediction request to add more context you know maybe it's uh you have a extra user data or whatnot and you want to add it to the request and that's um, all these are really good use cases okay here i'll just grab um one record from the feature store and i use the simple get record api passing the group name and the unique id as you would expect, there is also a put record API where you could store individual records into the feature group, right? We used bulk ingestion, but you could also um, add uh, individual records if you wanted to, okay? So this is what my record looks like. Uh, we can see uh, basically it's key value pairs with, you know, feature names and feature values. Nothing, uh, nothing really uh, unexpected. I'm only interested in the text, okay? So I've got this helper function that extracts just the review from that record, okay? And then this is what I pass to my prediction request, okay? Uh, using JSON for serialization and deserialization. And finally, I invoke my endpoint using the predict API, and I can see the probabilities for the three labels and of course this one is a highly positive one so there's no doubt okay so this is an example of going from a to z so to speak um, as mentioned earlier there's another option to uh, store data in future store um, but given the fact that i have a short session today i can't show you all of it uh, and this is uh, the integration between SageMaker data wrangler and SageMaker Feature Store. So Data Wrangler, like I said, is a visual tool that helps you prepare um, uh, data sets and apply built-in transforms and custom transforms uh, to, uh, to data, build a transform pipeline, and then export that pipeline to uh, different uh, destinations. One of them is actually a Jupyter Notebook uh, that will store your engineered features in SageMaker Feature Store. Okay, so you don't have to write all that code yourself, just like I've done here. Um, so this is a really good option if you can, uh, you know, if you're happy to work with Data Wrangler and if you get um, enough flexibility there to run all your transforms, um, export it to the notebook. Uh, it's super simple. It's one click. Uh, the two things you need to take care of are the uh, enabling the online store, right? If you if you want that and um, making sure you provide a record ID uh, column name and uh, a timestamp column name. Okay, I think these are placeholder values in the, uh, in the notebook. So you just have to worry about that, which is not worrisome at all. And, and then you can run the notebook and directly push your features to Feature Store. Okay, uh, very easy to do. So you, you, reading the doc and experimenting, you, you'll figure it out in no time. Okay, I'm out of time. So... A uh, few resources that I think you should like, okay, to get started. Uh, the product page, the uh, documentation, the feature store SDK, and the location for the notebook that I used, okay? All right, we've made it to the end of this session where we saw how to use feature store uh, to avoid running feature engineering code again and again. Uh, to make it easier to discover and share features and to help you run uh, the same features for training and prediction without having to rewrite any code. So I hope that was helpful. Go and try it. Send me feedback. Let me know uh, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, and please feel free to connect on Twitter, Medium, YouTube, or anywhere else. Okay? I hope this was good. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye.